Hi, you've heard me say this many times, probably, but I help managing directors sleep at night. I also provide big company controls for SMEs. I work as a part-time finance director and freelance financial controller. And the reason I've repeated that about helping managing directors sleep at night is I've got a new client. Just been in three days and the guy who was responsible for the finance is one of the directors and he tells me every time he goes he hasn't been able to sleep at night for months. <clears throat> he also said when I went in and he was interviewing me, he said, I like that strap line that's on your email and on your website about big companies controls for SMEs. That's what we need. Now that's the second guy who's actually said that. So hands up, who has a strap line in their business? I know Julie does, a musical one, Michael? Oh yeah, funny. So the, yeah, most of you do. It is worth doing. That strap line is so important. The other client that told me after the interview that that one line resonated with them it was a company I went into for 15 years and they provided over £150,000 worth of income. So I'm glad I've got that strap line. But what I'm going to do tonight is talk about how many people here are self-employed consultants? <clears throat> thought there'd be quite a few. How many are small business owners? Probably equally as many. Virtually everybody is one of those two. So I'm going to talk about essential tips for the self-employed consultant and the small business owner. So if I can give you a few tips on how to get the best price, how to gain and retain the best clients, how to get an advantage over your competitors, how to avoid the scourge of the self-employed, and that's bad debts, and how to get more income at the end of your projects without any work. Would that be useful? Would that be a good use of our time? Okay. I'm just very quickly going to go through. <clears throat> That's what we're going to do tonight then. The best price, the best clients, the competitive advantage, avoiding bad debts, and more income at the end of the projects. Very briefly, my career, in 1981, uh, I took my last exam as a Chartered Certified Accountant. I'm now a fellow, so that's 36 to 37 years. Experience, lots of grey hair, and grey hair means experience. You catch it from your sons and daughters, but it means experience. Then in 1988, I got a diploma in marketing, 1998, I went self-employed. <clears throat> the feast or famine nature of it means sometimes I'm self-employed, sometimes I'm self-unemployed. 2014, I bought out my first book called Buddha Late Than Never, which is a personal development book about life skills. And I've currently written nearly 13,000 words on the second book, which is a business book. So I'm going to give you a few tips and extracts from that tonight. So would that be a good use of our time? Yeah. What's it like to be self-employed? <clears throat> well, I actually regard myself now as being unemployable. <clears throat> the disadvantage, you lose security, don't you? And that's why most of us don't become self-employed earlier. That nervousness, that bit of fear, the loss of a secure income. And then when we do it, like me, most of us become unemployable. That's how I describe myself now. You don't answer to a boss. You have to be a self-starter. That's the disadvantage, if you like. The feast or famine nature, and we are subject to the vagaries of feast or famine nature. The feast or famine nature means when I have less work, 
I'd get better at tennis and racquetball. When I have a load of work, it could be four or five major projects, maybe things like helping people sell their business, I could be working 24-7. So it's a bit like a concertina of the work, and your social life and your work life have to kind of fit in and become one. I had an interesting experience in 2017. I've got quite a few new prospects come along, and I thought, I'm 62. I don't actually need the work. How am I going to regulate the amount of work? I thought, why not just put up my prices? So every new prospect that came along, I added 10% to the price. And hardly anybody said no. What does that mean? This is a big issue, isn't it? What it means is I've probably undercharged all those years. That bit of nervousness came in. So price. When I first became self-employed, somebody said to me, and I've read it many times since, you have to charge the market rate or the work will not be valued. And actually Terry said that to me about his book. If people don't want to pay the market rate, they won't value it. And it has been so true. Because you're creating your own perception. <clears throat> if you've got a quality product, why not charge a premium for it? If you are better than your competitors, shouldn't you be charging a premium for it? The price you charge will create a perception of your worth. And I can tell you from my experience, the only times I've really had problems with clients is when I've done work for charities, often free of charge. I've done work for mates. A friend of mine inherited his dad's business when his dad died. <clears throat> and the perception is different, isn't it, when you do work for free? Maybe they're approaching you thinking, I don't know if he's any good or not but at least it's cheap. But do you want cheap to be the perception created? I don't get problems when I charge the market rates. I don't get problems when I put the prices up. I do when I do work on the cheap. <clears throat> agencies. When I first became self-employed, I went to a lot of the temporary agencies and there's so many agencies in Birmingham, they can all supply qualified accountants. It's a cutthroat business, it's highly competitive, a third comes off the price straight away, the agency gets a third, you work as a temp and get a third, and you're a temp. The perception is you're disposable. It's again the wrong perception. So after two or three years of that, I thought, do I want to work 100% of the time for a third of the price? Or do I want to work a third of the time for 100% of the price? And if I'm networking and recommended and get referrals, I'm in a one-horse race. Isn't that a better way to do business? Create the right perception through pricing. What gets in the way of charging a higher price? I can talk from experience and from my mistakes and trial and error. Because in the early days I'd often sit in front of a prospect and I'd be thinking, I really could do with this work. I don't want to go in and charge too high a price. I don't want to put them off. So how do we stop that nervousness, that fear, false evidence appearing real? Fear doesn't, doesn't prevent death, it prevents life. 
Now my one top tip on getting the right price when you sit in front of your prospect, just imagine in your back pocket you have a million dollars. Because guess what? If you've got a million dollars in your back pocket and you believe it, you're going to be negotiating like I have for the last couple of years, putting the price up every time and just taking, taking the view that I'm going to deal with these people but on my terms. Not, I feel desperate. I really want this work. It's a different perception in our minds. So that's pricing. My big tip, just imagine you've got a million pounds in your back pocket. And that is recommended, and where I got it from is Sandler Sales Training. <clears throat> Clients. Oh, anybody, how many people here know David Heiner? An inspirational speaker, quite a few people. I went to hear David talking at the Professional Speakers Association. Tips on how to get the best price as a speaker. And what he said is very similar to what I was quoting earlier. Sell on value, not price. And don't forget your worth. Wise words. Sell on value, not price. And don't forget your worth. Clients. How to gain and retain the best clients. When I wrote my first book, and I wrote about perceived betrayal by friends, I came to the conclusion after years of reflection that what does make a great friend? For me, there has to be a relationship based on respect and trust, underpinned by honesty and loyalty. So what makes a great relationship between the self-employed consultant or the business owner and their clients? Well, that's be a relationship based on respect and trust, underpinned by honesty and loyalty, with professional competence. Anybody here heard of the Pareto Principle? What is it? Yeah, the 80-20 rule. So for most businesses, and I guess we all fall into that bracket, our 20% worst clients will probably give us 80% of the hassle and 80% of the risk of bad debts. And our 20% best clients will probably give us 80% of the profitability. So what we need to do is prune and cultivate. The founder of the world's biggest referral organisation, BNI, talks about addition by subtraction. Get rid of your worst 20% of members every year and everybody ups their game. Concentrate on getting the better members in. It's the same with our clients, isn't it? Why bother with the 20% worst clients? Let's imagine John's accountancy practice. In January, you'll have loads of people um, supplying all their books and records. You've got a tax deadline of the end of January. And that 20% of clients will always come in the last two or three days with half the job done. They'll be an absolute pain. They'll leave you working all hours. Just double the price. Move them on. Prune and cultivate. Yeah, prune and cultivate. Prune the worst 20% every year and cultivate the good ones. The worst clients for me are those who don't really know where I can contribute. They're not willing to change. They've run their business for decades. And I call it the magic wand syndrome. They're thinking, don't really know how Paul's going to help us. Let's just sit him in the corner and see if he improves our business. The magic wand. 
So if we are going to get rid of our prune our 20% worse clients and try and get more of the better clients, don't we need a grading system? How many people here either grade their clients or alternatively <coughs> work out their worst 20% and try and do something about getting rid of them or at least making them profitable? How many people? There's a few. Okay. Well, I started doing that now. So how do I do that? I've got just two criteria. First of all, price and payment. And actually, I've agreed the price. It's all in the contract anyway. It is profitable price-wise. But I say when I go in, we've all got mortgages. We've all got commitments. All my clients pay me within three days of me raising the invoice at the end of the month. If they don't, they're not a good client. If they don't pay promptly, they don't value the work that's being done. <coughs> Secondly, how many people give you great support? Imagine the football manager when everybody knows the chairman's giving him two matches or three matches before he loses his job. The players play up, they stop playing for the manager, it becomes an impossible job. My job's impossible if the directors don't support me. I have to have that support. We have to be travelling in the same direction. Under support, I've put standards. We've got to be working towards the same standards. If I want tight financial control, good cash control, and the directors aren't bothered, I'm wasting my time. Collective responsibility. I've, we've got to be working in the same direction. I went into one client, big problems, losing money hand over fist, and every time I told the manager director he lost more money, he got, became Mr. Angry, went up the wall, and in the end I had to say, let's say Jim, Jim, you're not taking responsibility. You're the managing director. I'm part of the solution. Don't blame me for the mess you're in. Interesting conversation. Because I then went on holiday for two weeks, I came back and he bought me a present and told me he'd reappraised all his uh, leadership style. So it worked. Not sure if it would always work. But you've got to be going in the same direction. You've got to get the support of the directors. And the ideal relationship is when you become a trusted advisor. <clears throat> okay. How do you differentiate yourself with your competitors when you go and meet a prospect? Anybody here when I did that presentation, 10 minute presentation about testimonials? Okay. When I was first getting work through the agencies, one guy, Ian, you know him, Rob Greenwell Gleason, he's now managing director. He said to me, Paul, I've got one contractor. He's not as good as you are. He's not as professional as you are. He's not even a qualified accountant. But he gets every bit of work he goes for. How does he do that? If one of my competitors goes in to meet the prospect before I do, let's say Jim, they think, oh, Jim's quite good. I go in, they think Paul's quite good. But if I dump a file on their desk, like this, with 50 testimonials, all exemplary, on the desk, there's independent third-party corroboration that I do do a good job, an excellent job. Who's going to get the work, me or Jim, if Jim hasn't provided one of these? Which is the safest pair of hands? What I do now, actually, I write my own testimonials. Things have moved on. 
I say to the client, we've got to the end of the project, it's, I think it's gone well, would you mind writing me a testimonial? Invariably they say, yeah, no problem, Paul. But some of them are actually streetwise. Could I trust them to write an exceptionally good testimonial? I'd rather write it myself. So I say, I'll tell you what, you're busy, we're all busy people, I can give you a Word document with a pro forma. By all means, change anything you want, and they rarely do. Yeah, would that be okay? Would that save you a lot of time? Yes, please, Paul. And if you see my website, or if you want to look at the testimonials file, they are very good testimonials. Paragraph one, the client statement. Just take something off the client's website saying how good the client is. You know the halo effect? People read it and think, this looks like a good company. They're not going to deal with Paul unless they think Paul's really good. Unless Paul has the same standards. Coming back to standards. Paragraph two, achievements. List the achievements while you've been working with them. Like I've reduced their borrowings by half a million pounds. Identified a trading division that was losing money that they've now turned into a profit-making organisation. Reduced the bad debts by 120,000 a year. And guess what? The client reads this and thinks, Paul has done a good job. Then lead them in by saying something like, what I like most about Paul's contribution was, and leave them to fill in the rest. Every testimonial will be different. And finally, confirming they're happy to give references. Okay. I'm going to miss the next one about closing the deal. Maybe I can talk about that later. How to avoid all bad debts. In the early days, I had two bad debts in the first five years. One company, it was a college in Birmingham, said they were going to start doing certified accountancy courses. Asked me to be a lecturer, said providing we get the students, you've got the work. They got the students, I did three weeks work, and then head office decided they weren't going to go ahead, pull the plug, got three weeks work, no money. I spoke to the director, I said I've got a contract here, you're in breach of contract took me out for a meal and said, Paul, if you take me to court, I will lie in court. <laughs> so what is the legal position? Well, I've got two clients where the main bookkeeper has handed in a notice and then handed in a sick note and got paid a month's pay for doing no work at all. In one case, it was about two or three months' work for doing no work at all. Because the court will always protect the employee against the employer. But what about the self-employed consultant? Or the business owner? It's one person's word against another, isn't it? If they want to say, well, we told you, Paul, that the course wasn't going to go ahead, and you still did the work, that was your problem. You're finished. No money. So what do I do now? I thought long and hard about this. There's a notice period in the contract that could be worthless. But it's not worthless, worthless for the employee, is it? Why don't I charge the notice period up front? I call that the advance fee of £2,000. For about 12 years, I've done no work unless somebody's given me £2,000 before I start. That's gone in my bank account. And I've told them that because I have money in my bank and I have no bad debts, they get a cheaper price. The only client that's really bulked against this turned out to be my worst payer. <laughs> Which speaks volumes, doesn't it? That advance fee means I saved a great deal of money. 
no bad debts for tw over 30, no, fi over 15 years. Then I get to the end of the contract. I help somebody sell their business. This is an example 18 months ago. A director said to me afterwards, Paul, thank you, your help has been invaluable. We couldn't have done it without you. They got the maximum payments they wanted from the buying company. It had gone very well. He said, we have paid all your invoices, haven't we? I said, yes, thanks, Jim. All the invoices are paid. He said, great, there's just the advance fee then, isn't there, you owe us? I said, yeah, there is the advance fee, but there's also the notice period. Ah, oh, how much is the notice period? Well, it's three months at so many days. I'll do a quick calculate. Oh, it's £5,400. Ah, oh. I'll tell you what, Paul. Do you fancy just keeping the advance fee and we'll call it quits? <coughs> so he's happy, he saved £3,400. And I'm happy because I've got £2,000 for doing no work. Income at the end of the project. I wouldn't have had that a few years earlier. I know Nicholas is going to tell me soon. My half hour is nearing an end, so I'm going to miss the networking referral and presentation skills. But I did just mention, how, how long have we got before somebody decides they're going to do business with you? Or if you go to an interview, how many seconds before people decide they want to do business, they want to take you on? It's seven seconds. So how many people here have got a seven second presentation? You know what I do? Sarah Whittaker has done my websites a really good job. So before I go to see a prospect, I say, I tell you what will save you a lot of time. Why don't you just look at my website first? There's loads of really good testimonials on there. I turn up and in seven seconds I don't have to sell myself. The website's done that. The testimonials have done that. Independent third-party corroboration. I just have to appear to be reasonably smart, reasonably pleasant, I've got the work and professionally competent. It's visibility plus credibility that gives you profitability. That's the founder of the world's biggest referral organisation who said that, Ivan Meisner. How do you differentiate yourself from all the other people, your competitors? who've applied. Self-employment or being a business owner is not for everybody. And reward only comes before work in the dictionary. You are worth good clients. The best price with the security an employed person has. <coughs> Self-employment is not for everybody, but it probably is the best decision I ever made. Thank you.